Hello, my name's Richard Noble. I'm the project director of Bloodhound. Way back in 1997, we broke the land speed record with the thrust as a C car. We achieved the first ever supersonic land speed record, the car which Andy Green drove. And we all swore we'd never ever do this again. The financial and mechanical and engineering trauma on a thing like this is absolutely massive. And with the Thrust SSC project 17 years ago, uh, basically everybody was absolutely knackered when we finished. We all swore we'd never ever do this again. And then of course what happened was that uh, the late and great Steve Fawcett decided he was after the land speed record. So Andy and I met in a pub. We said, what on earth are we going to do? So we decided then and there we'd take him on and we'd try and set the bar so high that he couldn't possibly come back. And the follow-on meeting with Ron, the aerodynamicist, I said, um, OK, Ron, we're talking about Mach 1.5, one and a half times the speed of sound. And Ron was absolutely horrified. So a bit of horse trading went on and we ended up at Mach 1.4, which is 1,000 miles an hour. I'm Wing Commander Andy Green, I'm a fighter pilot in the Royal Air Force and I'm the driver for the Bloodhound Supersonic Car. I'm lucky to have what is probably the best possible training programme to get ready for Bloodhound and that is join the Royal Air Force, fly fighters for 20 years. I've been taught by some of the best in the world to deal with jet engines, supersonics, precision control, etc. And before that, indeed, a background in mathematics, I understand the numbers and the technology behind what we're trying to achieve. Do a little bit of track training. I did uh, a season, radical racing last season, just to get the feel of a car moving around. First time you get into a four-wheel drift at 100 miles an hour, it's a terrifying feeling. Multiply that by three or four or five times, it's exactly the way Bloodhound will behave on the desert. I've just had a chance to practice it relatively slowly to get a sense for what the car's doing and how to control it. And of course, I've got the background of having done this before in Thrust SSC. Ron came up with this very clever idea, which was to use a jet and a rocket motor. So that was the, the, the start, and it was a very clever idea because it means that all the uh, low speed and medium speed and low high speed work can be done on the jet engine alone. And the jet engine just burns jet fuel, so it's not expensive. The rocket, of course, is something else, and the rocket is very expensive. So therefore, you only use that for high-speed runs. So when we're considering a high-speed run, where the car will go through the measured mile in about 3.6 seconds, the Andy will accelerate to around about uh, 300, 350 miles an hour on the jet alone, then bring in the rocket motor. So he's then got the rocket motor and the jet, and uh, that'll get him from zero to 1,000 miles an hour in something just over 50-odd seconds. Unlike any other form of motor racing, there's no other traffic out there. We don't run in bad conditions. We choose the weather. We choose it when there's low crosswinds, there's no rain, and the, the car is ready, and the team is ready, and the track is ready. It's a hand-cleared track. The South Africans have spent five years preparing the most extraordinary racing surface in land speed record history. 20 million square metres hand-cleared, and now water level to produce this incredible racing surface. When you look at a track with no traffic and no obstacles and no bumps and nothing else out there and 12 miles of perfectly clear track, you only have to do two things to keep the car safe. Number one, keep all the wheels on the ground all the time. And number two, stop before you get to the end of the track. Because it's the first car of the digital age, we can actually stream live video and live data from this most extraordinary land speed record car. And not only to reach a global audience, genuinely in live terms, they, they are right at the cutting edge of learning about science and technology in this extraordinary high-speed, land-speed record environment. And in doing that, we're not just about showcasing great British technology, it's much wider than that. It's about inspiring that next generation. Globally, the, uh, the kids who are going to build that high technology, low carbon, energy efficient world of the future, bring the whole thing to, uh, to life for them in the most exciting way possible. That, in very simple terms, is what Bloodhound's going to achieve. The wow factor. What actually happens, of course, is that you're running the car a lot of times and you're gradually increasing the speed and gradually improving the car, so rarely, Whilst everybody um, around the team and on the desert will think this is a big day, it's really an, just another run. It's, it's a routine. This is an enormous project, um, and we're running it with uh, very few people. We've got a total of about 81 people on the program. And there's a whole lot of activities that have to carry on in parallel, which makes it very difficult. So for instance, uh, we've got to do the education. We've got to sort out the desert. We've got to build the car. We've got to sort out the rocket motor. We've got to get the supply of jet engines. 
um, you know, and of course the, the global STEM program. It's a massive thing and all that's got to happen simultaneously uh, because if you did it sequentially, it would take 50 years, you know, and everybody would get bored. So the key was that we had to start off with something big and that was a jet engine. And we had a meeting with a minister called Lord Drayson, who was responsible for buying aircraft and ships for the Ministry of Defence. He came up with the idea of actually running the education programme because in all these, most of these uh, advanced countries, there's absolute nightmare, shortage of engineers and scientists. And in Britain, I mean, it's really, really severe. So Drayson had this idea of, uh, of using the project as an education programme, as an education stimulant. And we have over 6,000 schools in Britain on it now. It's very, very big. Our job is not to teach. Our job is to inspire them, to get them all excited. Kids are seeing we're grafting like hell uh, using the best skills we can possibly find in the country to create an absolutely outstanding car. This is not just about another land speed record. Frankly, we could almost just get thrust SSC out of the museum, give it a good polish and go slightly faster. This is about a, a genuine step change to go as fast as it is possible to go with modern technology. And there are limitations in there. We're hitting the limitations of the aerodynamic design as we understand it. And we've had to develop that over the last few years, even to get to 1,000. If somebody else has got a good idea to go to 11 or 1200 miles an hour, then absolutely the best of luck to them. But the Bloodhound team will be telling the story of the world's first 1000 mile an hour world land speed record attempt for a long time to come, and hopefully inspiring other people to have a go at breaking it. I think it's gonna take a long time, and I'm pretty confident we will be watching.